You said it. There is some skepticism, but more than a month into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the first significant signs of progress are being reported in peace talks between the two countries. Representatives met for more than three hours in Turkey yesterday following weeks of fighting. In those talks, Ukrainian officials reportedly agreed to declare their country permanently neutral, abandoning any hope of joining NATO, and agreed to discuss possibly conceding some of their own territory, which Russia already has claimed for itself. In exchange, a group of outside nations would provide, quote, security guarantees to Ukraine in the event of a future attack. This hypothetical group, which would could include the United States, reportedly would commit to providing Ukraine with military aid and a no-fly zone. Unclear, however, if any outside nations have signed on to this guarantee or ever would. So, Mika, these are very broad strokes here. They had a meeting, a good meeting for three hours, but obviously there is no trust at this point from Ukraine to Russia, given what we've seen over the last month. Yeah, during those talks, Russia also vowed to significantly scale back military operations near Kyiv and another northern Ukrainian city. But that announcement has been met with so much skepticism from the United States and Ukraine. They've seen this movie before. A White House official confirms a small number of Russian troops are moving away from Kyiv, but says it may be just an indication of Putin adjusting from his original plan and that Moscow may be simply repositioning. Here's what President Biden and members of his administration had to say. I don't read anything into it until I see what their actions are. We'll see if they follow through on what they're suggesting. We're going to continue to keep strong the sanctions. We're going to continue to provide the Ukrainian military with their capacity to defend themselves. And we're going to continue to keep a close eye on what's going on. Nobody should be fooling ourselves by the Kremlin's now recent claim that it will suddenly just reduce military attacks near Kyiv or any reports that it's going to withdraw all its forces. Has there been some movement by some Russian units away from Kyiv uh, in the last day or so? Yeah, we think so. Small numbers. But we believe that this is a repositioning, not a real withdrawal and that we all should be prepared to watch for a major offensive against other areas of Ukraine. There is what Russia says, and there's what Russia does. We're focused on the latter. And what Russia is doing is the continued brutalization of Ukraine uh, and its people. Uh, and that uh, continues as we speak. Let's bring in retired four-star Navy Admiral and former NATO Supreme Allied Commander James Tavridis. He's Chief International Security and Diplomacy Analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. Former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Bill Taylor is with us. And White House Bureau Chief at Politico, Jonathan Lemire. He's the host of Way Too Early. Admiral Stavridis, I'll start with the key question here, and that is that Russia has said what it said. But what would be the proof that um, the West could glean out of I don't know, satellite images or other intelligence ways, what would be the way to find out that there might be proof that this scale back is actually happening? Well, you start, Mika, with uh, the tower of lies that we've dealt with from the Russians. So you start from a of position course. of extreme skepticism, as, as you well know. Um, number two, you focus your overhead imagery. So that is, in fact, a satellite capability. And that's optical. It's infrared. You can see movements uh, based on engines moving on the ground. So there are many technical means, as the intelligence community would say. Number three, you talk to the Ukrainians. They're on the ground. They're fighting. They're intermixed with many of these Russian units, and they've been doing a terrific job, obviously, of destroying units. They also know where the units are. So you're also using that level of intelligence that you're getting, boots on the ground, eyes in front of those troop formations. So you're using all of that intelligence. And then finally, Mika, you're also monitoring communications. And we don't want to get into depth on all of that, but there's certainly capability there. And uh, you put all that together. Intelligence, you know, is not like taking a photograph. Intelligence is like building a mosaic. You're kind of putting a piece here, a piece there. You put it all together, you have pretty good indication. I'm confident we'll have a good sight picture on what the Russians actually 
do. That's what's important here. As the war yeah. in Europe continues, Ukraine's neighbors remain on high alert. The United Nations now says more than four million Ukrainians have fled the country since the war began five weeks ago. Thousands of them have made their way to Latvia. The NATO member shares a border with Russia and is now just over 600 miles away from Ukraine. For perspective, that's about the same distance of Washington, D.C. to Atlanta. Also, Moscow uh, is equidistant. Uh, the president of Latvia, Egil Levitz, joins us now. Mr. President, thank you so much for joining us. I, I have a, a lot of questions for you. My first is just please uh, give us a sense of what you make of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine and now claims he is scaling back. Yes, of course, uh, Russia has violated uh, international law, the main principles of international law, which uh, lie, lie down already in, in the United uh, Nations statutes from uh, 45. It's a gravest violation of uh, the independence, uh, 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 territorial sovereignty of another state. And our world peace order is based on uh, these principles, which uh, Russia is now violating. Concerning uh, the latest um, informations uh, about uh, Russian intention, I would say we have no reason to trust Russia, to trust uh, Lavrov, to trust uh, Putin, uh, if we uh, would see in reality that there are some actions that uh, they are stopping uh, the aggression, then, of course, then there will be another situation. But now, uh, such kind of announcements, there is no reason to trust in that. There is a rather maybe a repositioning of the Russian forces from one, uh, from, from one front to another front, uh, but that uh, not, uh, do not mean um, a stopping uh, of the aggression. Do you have any sense uh, of anything that hasn't been done yet uh, through NATO or on the part of the United States that could perhaps um, inspire Vladimir Putin to pull back? Yes, there is uh, one uh, very uh, important uh, tool that is to give weapons to Ukraine because only the resistance of Ukraine uh, is a reason for uh, for Russia to stop the aggression. We see that uh, Putin counted that uh, uh, Ukraine will resist maybe two, three days, and uh, he will uh, have a, a kind of blitzkrieg. No, it's not the, uh, not the case. Uh, Ukraine is highly motivated to, uh, to defend uh, the country. And we, uh, the free world, um, NATO, uh, all democratic states should support uh, Ukraine be because Ukraine is fighting also for our values. This is one thing. The second thing is to isolate Russia from uh, international world, from international economy. This is uh, done by heavy sanctions. Uh, the sanctions are already in force, but it's not all sanctions. There are a lot of potential to increase the sanctions. So on one side, Ukraine, mm -hmm. U Ukraine is fighting for uh, the country. And um, uh, in principle, Ukraine is stopping uh, the aggression. Uh, through uh, military means and then economic means by by uh, European Union, by United States, uh, also uh, to um, have a heavy pressure to a Russian economy because the Russian economy is feeding the military. And if the Russian economy uh, suffers, of course, then uh, the military force uh, is also uh, at stake for Russia. There's also, of course, the ongoing concern that this escalates, that this goes beyond Ukraine's borders. And I'm, I'm wondering about the Three Seas Summit that you are hosting in a few months. The goal, of course, is to accelerate uh, the development 
of uh, cross-border energy transport and digital infrastructure uh, in the region between the Black, the Baltic, and the Adriatic Seas. And I'm wondering if the Russian invasion of Ukraine really reinforces the need for these goals, perhaps help uh, strengthen Central Europe uh, from Russia's aggression. Yes, uh, I would say that uh, Russia uh, is uh, the, uh, has the intention to to f uh, follow the line which is already started by Ukraine, and uh, the weakness of the West, the weakness of United States, the weakness of Europe is an invitation of uh, Russia to do so. It is a provocation for Russia. Uh, our weakness. But we are not weak. NATO is not weak. United States are not weak. And uh, European Union are not, uh, is not weak. And therefore, we, uh, our answer, our right response is to show uh, uh, strength. Uh, we should uh, strengthen the NATO eastern flank through further deployment of U.S. troops, of uh, uh, troops of other NATO uh, countries to this area. So uh, we, there was already last uh, uh, last week a summit of the uh, NATO states in Brussels. We decided to double the number of uh, NATO multinational uh, battle groups from four to eight in different countries. So uh, this is the right answer to Russia, and this is a real peace politics, because only our strengths can uh, guarantee peace. Good morning, Mr. President. Thank you for taking some time with us this morning. Among your two million or so citizens in Latvia, you have a large Russian population, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's about a quarter of your population. I'm curious, given the way that Vladimir Putin has framed his invasion of Ukraine as sort of reunifying Russia and bringing those people back in to what Russia he believes should be. I'm curious about the reaction from the Russians who live in Latvia about what he's doing. Uh, the Russian minority is uh, largely integrated in our uh, society. Of course, uh, like in other uh, democratic countries, uh, like, uh, for example, in United States, in Germany, or in Latvia, also there are a small minority which supports uh, Russia, which supports uh, uh, Putin, but it is uh, a minority. Uh, small minority and uh, in general uh, uh, the Latvian people are overwhelmingly uh, supporting Ukraine. It is a, a real mm. uh, overwhelming support on, uh, for Ukraine. That's interesting. Mr. President, Andrea Mitchell has a question for you. Andrea? Thanks so much. Uh, Mr. President, I was in your wonderful country not too long ago for the NATO summit and uh, enjoyed your hospitality. Thank you and your people. Uh, so now at this juncture, when there are talks in Turkey, what do you think of this proposal that Ukraine has made to have other countries as a guarantor, if you will, of the security going forward? Uh, could that be trusted? Uh, would Turkey, France, Israel have been mentioned, maybe Finland and Sweden? Uh, could that be done without, if they include some NATO members like Turkey and France, without getting into a NATO guarantee, uh, which NATO, of course, has resisted? NATO is a... Uh uh, Ukraine is is partner of NATO, but right. it is uh, till now not uh, uh, an ally of uh, NATO, not a member of NATO. And therefore, uh, the proposal of uh, the Ukrainian side to have uh, several states as guarantors, uh, I think it's very interesting. It is uh, if it is. Uh, proposed uh, uh, from uh, President Zelensky from Ukrainian side, then I would support uh, this uh, proposal. All right. President of Latvia, Agia Levitz, thank you so very much for being on the show with us. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Former President Donald Trump has praised Vladimir Putin as savvy and a genius during Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now he's asking Putin for dirt on President Biden's son, Hunter. One thing while I'm on your show, as long as Putin now is not exactly 
a fan of our country. Let him explain where did, because Chris Wallace wouldn't let me ask the question, why did the mayor of Moscow's wife give the Bidens, both of them, three and a half million dollars? That's a lot of money. She gave him three and a half million dollars. So now I would think Putin would know the answer to that. I think he should release it. I think we should know that answer. Now, you won't get the answer from Ukraine, but why are they giving somebody who knows nothing about energy $187,000 a month plus a $3 million upfront payment? And I won't even talk about China because they haven't gone into yeah. Taiwan yet. Right. That'll be next. But why did the mayor of Moscow's wife give the Biden family $3.5 million dollars Nobody wants to ask the question. And Chris Wallace, who's a total lightweight, unlike his father, who interviewed me for 60 Minutes, who was actually a good piece. Mike Wallace was great. He wants to be Mike Wallace, but he doesn't have the talent. But why is it that the mayor of Moscow's wife gave the Biden family three and a half million dollars? I think Putin now would be willing to probably give that answer. I'm sure he knows. A fact check. Uh, the payments the former president is referring to come from a highly criticized Republican-led Senate report released just weeks before the 2020 election. It maintained that Elena Baterina, the widow of Moscow's former mayor, wired $3.5 million to a firm that was associated with Hunter Biden. The report did not show that Hunter Biden received any of that money. In addition, Hunter Biden's legal team has long claimed that he had no interest in the firm and was not paid any of the money in question. As to Trump's claims that Putin knows something about the payments, the Russian president has previously said he was unaware of any business ties between Hunter Biden and Baterina. One thing Trump failed to mention, according to reports, Trump himself was seeking out business with the former mayor of Moscow back in the late 1990s. He had pageants, he had a pageant there, he was very involved with Russia. But at this point, Ambassador Bill Taylor, since you were there uh, during this first um, debacle where the president wanted to get dirt on the political rival from President Zelensky, your thoughts on what you just heard from the former president of the United States? Well, Mika, um, we know uh, that in the summer of uh, 2019, um, there was discussion of additional weapons uh, for Ukraine. Um, we know uh, that uh, the United States had been providing these Javelin missiles. Uh, the Trump administration, uh, to its credit, had been providing these Javelin missiles that were very effective, as we know, as we're now seeing how effective these Javelins are. And there was, uh, there was interest on the, the Ukrainians. I was there at the time. Uh, we're very interested in additional weapons, additional javelins. Uh, and there was a phone call where they had this conversation with President Trump. Uh, President Zelensky asked for uh, support for this sale, uh, for additional. And uh, as we know, uh, President Trump asked for a favor um, on this same topic of investigations uh, into his political rival. Um, in the end, uh, those weapons went, thank goodness, they were held up for a period of time, which was troubling for the Ukrainians. Uh, but in the end, these weapons uh, went and they, as we see, are now putting to great use against the Russians. So, Jonathan Lemire, Mika just said it. Vladimir Putin has already addressed this unsubstantiated claim about this payment. He did it in October 2020 on the eve of the presidential election. In fact, if you look at the interview, he effectively rolled about this. He waved it away. And now it's it's worth stopping and, and taking stock in the middle of what we're watching in Russia. Not only did Donald Trump watch the horrors of what we're seeing in Ukraine and say, quote, this is genius and say this is wonderful. But now he's taking the side of Vladimir Putin and saying, let's exploit the way Vladimir Putin feels about the United States right now and get him to give me this invented dirt that came out of a report authored by Ron Johnson of Wisconsin. Uh, you know, we're not shocked anymore by Donald Trump, but the things he said during this war, I think, rise to that level.
Yeah, it is hard to be shocked by him, but this is so galling. It's just so galling. Not only are there echoes of that 2016 moment where he openly asked Russia for help, and we know, thanks to the Mueller report, it was that night that the GRU started dump accessing some of those hacked WikiLeaks, the Clinton emails that they were seemed like they were responding to what Trump asked. Echoes, of course, as Ambassador Taylor just said, of two and a half years ago uh, and his efforts to get dirt on the Bidens by extortion uh, of Ukrainian President Zelensky, and to now do so during a war where Vladimir Putin is committing war crimes. The United States has yep. deemed that Putin and the Russian soldiers have committed war crimes, and yet Trump is asking him for help. It is truly staggering. And Admiral Stavridis, just want to get your, your taking a step back here, just your sense of how damaging this all is in terms of where it's Trump and some other voices on the right, including in the conservative media, uh, who still seem sort of sympathetic uh, to the Russian cause, where we know those video clips are being circulated on state TV in Russia. Uh, just how does this undermine what the war effort here to hear someone? This is the former president of the United States openly asking Vladimir Putin for help. Yeah, it, it, it's the wrong message at the wrong time. And in particular, I'm struck by President Trump saying that uh, President Putin is a genius. If he's a genius, why is his invasion failing so publicly, so broadly? Why did he so completely overestimate the capabilities of his generals? Why is he mortgaging the future of his nation by cracking its economy? Why is he turning to other authoritarian nations around the world uh, to continue to trade with Russia? None of that's going to work. It's going to diminish his nation. Um, he is anything but a genius. And for uh, senior U.S. political figures to call him a genius is uh, shocking in the extreme. And he's also, as you say, Jonathan, a moral failure. He's someone who has committed war crimes uh, throughout his career, if you will. But Syria, to what is going on now, all you need to do is look at a photograph of Mariupol. You know everything you need to know about Vladimir Putin. He is not a genius. He's as far from it as I can imagine a human being being. Well, let's bring in Morning Joe reporter Daniela Pierre Bravo. Daniela, tell us about some of the organizations facing down this humanitarian crisis. Good morning, Mika. As tens of thousands of refugees cross into Poland from Ukraine each day, some of the first faces they see belong to team members of Polish humanitarian action, like press officer Helena Kraczewka, who has been working on both sides of the border. That work includes providing translators who speak Ukrainian, English, and Russian. In one case, those translators were able to save the life of a newborn baby who arrived in Poland with hypothermia. Helena also talked about the people still in Ukraine unable able to leave. Social workers are caring for the elderly, single mothers, and the disabled. That includes providing food, water, and hygiene products. Don't forget, temperatures there often drop below freezing, so the group is also bringing cold to families who otherwise wouldn't be able to heat their homes. And another organization at the front lines of the crisis is AmeriCares. I spoke with Vice President of Emergency Programs Kate Deschino and Polish Field Officer Adam Keene, who told me the number one need is medicine in medical supplies in Ukraine. Many hospitals, hospitals are simply out of essentials, from bandages to antibiotics. AmeriCares just transported 12 tons of medical supplies to Ukraine, delivered last week in the middle of the night. And then, of course, Mika, there is a psychological support needed for refugees that includes emergency funding for crisis counseling to respond to refugees who are enduring the trauma of war, fleeing to new communities where they don't know where the next step of their life is going to look look like. In a testament to just how dire the situation is right now, the organization has planned to have a presence in Poland at least for six months. International mm -hmm. Federation of the Red Cross is another one of those leading organizations we often hear of in times of large-scale uh, operations providing relief. It's working directly this time with the Polish and Ukrainian Red Crosses to combine eight efforts for displaced refugees. One coordinator based in Ukraine told me one 
one of the things that has made such a difference is providing things such as SIM cards and mobile charging stations to help families stay in touch. In conjunction with the Polish Red Cross, they're hoping to also roll out this week prepaid debit cards to some of the most vulnerable refugees. This will help them provide access to cash to people who otherwise wouldn't have it. Not only will it give them access to basic necessities, but in the words of that coordinator, it'll help them uh, provide these refugees with the dignity to be able to make choices in a time where they have such little control over what comes next. Yeah, and people, uh, the Polish Red Cross is doing such an amazing job, uh, by the way. And I know I hear from people everywhere across the world asking, how can I help? So where can they learn more? Because there's obviously some organizations that you might not want to turn to, but there are a lot of organizations that are very credible and can really make good use of financial contributions or anything else. Yeah, that's right. So each of the organizations I just spoke to uh, about has info on their websites, offering ways oh, uh, for people to donate and get involved. And we'll also be posting that info on our uh, website, joe.msnbc.com. All right. Morning, Joe. Reporter Daniela Pierre Bravo, thank you very much for that. And coming up. The Biden administration has released its budget proposal for the next fiscal year, complete with a bump in funding for the Department of Defense. The Air Force and Space Force are using those funds to better prepare the country's armed forces for the future. Leaders say a new direction ne is necessary to keep up with China. Joining us now, Under Secretary of the United States Air Force, Gina Ortiz Jones. Very good to have you on the show with us. We'll get to China in just a moment, but uh, given the uh, aggression, the Russian aggression in Ukraine, uh, one of the biggest issues uh, has to do with the Air Force, and that's the discussion of a potential no fly zone and, of course, the big issue of jets. Can you talk to us about the challenges on both of those fronts? Well, good morning, Nick. It's really a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, you know, the president has been very clear about our policy on a, on a no-fly zone. Um, we are encouraged by the way in which the alliance has really rallied. The alliance has never been stronger, um, and we continue to look for ways to make sure that we're uh, supporting Ukraine's efforts to defend itself, uh, defend its, uh, its and its territorial integrity. Secretary Ortiz Jones, thank you for being with us this morning. Good morning. So, if the no fly zone is off the table, and you all have made very clear, the president has made clear that there will not be a no fly zone despite requests from President Zelensky. As someone like you who understands what it means to sort of fight over control of the airspace, how do you control what Russia is doing? How do you stop what Russia is doing from the air, uh, which is wiping out entire cities like Mariupol in the absence of a no fly zone? Well, you know, as we as we look at the way ahead, I mean, we're doing this in concert with our partners and allies. Um, it's been two billion dollars that the administration has provided in security assistance since the start of the administration. It's been just about a billion dollars over the last couple of weeks. So I think there can be no question about our commitment to the Ukrainian people. Um, but we are looking to to make sure that we're making um, um, measured steps in concert with our allies in the interest of long term stability in the region. So obviously their focus has been Russia, but so much of this budget is, is indeed about mm. China. So let, let's pivot there. Tell, tell us why, why this is needed, what sort of threat China poses, and also the part, the, the role that Space Force plays in this, which I think is a lot as a branch of the military that a lot of people don't really know much about when then President Trump introduced it a few years ago. Tell us what role it will play. Yeah. Well, so we are very excited about this budget. This is a record budget the administration has, has provided not just to the Department of Defense, but as you mentioned, the Department of the Air Force, uh, split between the Air Force and the Space Force. Um, and Secretary Kindle, the Secretary of the Air Force, has been very clear about the transformation that is needed. Uh, when we think about the capabilities and the platforms that enabled us to be successful in a counter violent extreme against counter, uh, violent extremist organizations in the Middle East, that's just a different set of capabilities than what we will need in the high end fight in the Indo Pacific. And so this is very much tied to our understanding of what are those capabilities that we're going to need to have air superiority and space superiority. To your point about the Space Force, um, when you look at just the investments um, that China has made, certainly in their military, but in their in their Chinese, in their in their um, in their space capabilities in particular, um, it's important that we have um, we continue to have space superiority. So you'll look you'll see in the budget, for example, uh, investments in a 
resilient architecture focused on missile warning, missile tracking. Um, and these are the types of things that are so critical, not only, for example, the GPS, but it's really those same satellites that enable something that affects everyone's every day, such as ATM banking, right? So space is decisive. Uh, this budget reflects our commitment to making sure that we have the capabilities to ensure space superiority. This uh, budget also reflects, though, the transformation that's needed in our capabilities to ensure we have air superiority. So things, for example, for uh, for those that really want to nerd out on it, on the next generation of, uh, of uh, air dominance and the family of systems, what are those new types of, of uh, fighter platforms and capabilities that we'll need? That's all reflected in this budget based on, again, the urgency with which we need to transform. All right, Undersecretary of the Air Force, Gina Ortiz-Jones, if you could